I was living the dream. I landed a job at a major Wall Street financial banking firm right after graduation. I moved to New York City. Every Thursday night, my firm would throw penthouse parties where I got to enjoy a view like this. I'd have to work really hard, but I knew my career was set. When I came onto Wall Street, I came on as a software engineer. I had to go through intense financial markets boot camp training. The same people who trained me are people who trained the presidents of the United States. All this training, I learned about different financial models, different players, ratings agencies, all that stuff. But after all the end of that training, I came away with this takeaway, that the only reason financial instruments like stocks are worth what they're worth is because that's what people say what they're worth. That threw me for a loop, that some people's perception creates everyone's reality. But hey, you know, these well-groomed Ivy League graduates who are our traders, our quants, leaders in our industry, our CEO, surely they knew what was going on. And wasn't I so lucky because I was selected to be on this ride and maybe one day I too would have a penthouse in Manhattan. That was just after graduation, summer 2007. I have some technical difficulties here. Oh. All right. So by December, by December 2007, the financial markets crashed. Our CEO was ousted. Our firm's stock dropped 80%. I remember one weekend hearing that our investment bank was forced into a merger with another by the government. I wasn't sure when I came in on Monday if I could push open the door to get into our building. Within the next two years, almost all of my cohort was laid off. I had landed at the mouth of the Great Recession, and my big lesson was, nobody knows what they're doing. <laughs> Enter Bitcoin. Bitcoin was born around this time, and its central premise is similar to my takeaway, that maybe we shouldn't be trusting all these traditional institutions with our affairs. Maybe there's a way to operate without them. Bitcoin is a digital currency, sure. You've heard about it in the news. But there's so much more to it. The engine behind Bitcoin, its blockchain network, is really the bigger deal here. That is surely going to touch all your careers and change the trajectory of your future. So let's learn about it. Well, before we do that, let's talk about what's been traditionally done in our record keeping. We have always relied on institutions for our record keeping and to handle our affairs. And that's really a vestige of a time when we weren't so well connected. So we had to seek institutions that were, say, better, better located or had more physical security, the capacity to keep records, the education to do so, because for much of history, most of us were illiterate. So this record keeping was kept siloed and away from the public. Well, the Bitcoin network takes advantage of the fact that we are connected like never before. This is the Bitcoin network. It's geopolitically spread, as you see. And anyone can be on this network. All they need is a connection to the internet and also to be able to download Bitcoin Core software, which is an open source software. So there are no special permissions needed to be on this network. I said distributed network. Let's talk about that a little bit more to understand its significance. To do that, let's compare it to tr traditional networks, like centralized networks. In a centralized network, there's one major component or player that has superior read-write access to a record. The network is highly dependent on that player. So for example, the Federal Reserve telling us how much money in currency, how much money is in circulation, we kind of have to rely on that central player. But that network is very vulnerable. A hacker knows exactly where to attack. And if that central player fails in some way, the whole network fails. <laughs> Even in a decentralized network that maybe has a consortium of major players, like our major financial banks, there are still points where a hacker can attack and take down a significant amount of the network. In a distributed network, however, a network like Bitcoins, every player has the ability to have equal read-write access over the record and has their own copy of the, of the record. So even if a hacker takes down a node or a player, the network is not compromised. 
let's take a look at an actual Bitcoin transaction. So notice here, we're able to see the entire history of a Bitcoin, an amount of Bitcoin, from its origin to every point in which it is transacted. So we have transparency here. But the interesting thing about Bitcoin's network is that there's also this de-identification. So although we can tell that this Bitcoin amount has moved between accounts, we can't tell what those accounts are or who they belong to. So there's transparency, but there's also privacy. I want to peek under the hood a little bit more so you can understand why the record is called a blockchain and why that's so revolutionary. So in Bitcoin's network, all players are called nodes, and some players elect to take part in the validation scheme of the record. These are called miners. What happens on this network is every 10 minutes, all transactions are broadcast to all the miners in the network. And then the miners begin a race to trace those transactions, to validate them, and then apply complicated mathematical and cryptographic processes to batch those transactions and offer them for review to the other miners. When the other miners come to a consensus that yes, this batch, this block is valid, then the original proposer is awarded Bitcoin. And this happens every 10 minutes. So here we have this record that's distributed that uses state-of-the-art cryptographic processes that has this incentivization scheme too going on between these people who do not even know each other. So because we rely on every one, we rely on no one. And that's what makes this record tamper-proof. And it could be the engine for so much more than just Bitcoin. All right, so we talked about currency, but what if we programmed other types of tokens to encapsulate other types of assets we have. So for example, your Wake Forest degree. Right now, anyone can go on LinkedIn and say that they graduated from Wake Forest. Imposters who do that devalue your degree. What if instead, Wake Forest issued a token that was their degree? So if it was ever in question whether or not you truly graduated from Wake Forest, someone could track that token to see that it originated at, at Wake Forest on the blockchain. Another example is our creative assets. Imagine we have tokens that could encapsulate our digital art, our photography, our videography, our literature. And an artist could actually track where her token is going in the stream of commerce and monetize off it automatically, whichever account it goes to. No longer is she reliant on pennies per click on ad space. She doesn't have to rely on a publisher. This is a whole new way of monetizing on our intellectual property. Medical health records, this is really big. We, we have just terrible interoperability between our hospitals right now. Every time you go on vacation, you're taking a risk that if you go to your destination and you get injured, your physician there will not be able to access your records back home. This compromises your care. What if instead we had a token that could encapsulate our medical health records and could be de-encrypted and downloaded by people with appropriate permissions? That would improve your quality of care. Components of our identity, that can be segregated and tokenized too. Right now, when you go to the bar and you get carded, you have to show the bartender your name, your address, and your actual date of birth because you're handing over your driver's license. Well, what if instead the DMV issued tokens, one of which was, was one that had your face or your image and also automatically calculated whether or not you were over 21? That way, you only have to show the, the bartender that token and he or she could automatically trace whether or not that truly came from the DMV. This mitigates the risk of identity theft. Supply chain management, this is huge. All major players in supply chain management are looking at the blockchain as a way to be able to trace supplies from their origin to the end consumer. This has so many life-changing life and life-saving possibilities. For example, each year, half a million people die from foodborne illnesses. So companies like Dole are looking at the blockchain to be able to see where foods come from. And when things go wrong, they can quickly pull foods that are from a bad source from the market. All right, home titles. This is also really big. In developing nations, 
People who own assets are at risk every time their unstable government changes. Because all of a sudden, the government and their cronies say, oh, you don't really own that property, you know, one of our friends do. This leads to bribery and corruption. What if instead people were able to track title to their homes on the blockchain in this geopolitically spread network so that it could survive whatever regime change there is? And this isn't just big in the developing world. Cook County, Illinois is also looking to put land title records on the blockchain so that people don't have to go to an attorney or title searcher to validate whether a seller, for example, has title to be able to give that house. What else can this technology do? Well, it, this technology is emerging, so you get to decide. Think about it. What data needs to be private, authenticated, secured, yet readily accessible? Where do we have needs for better interoperability? In this coming age of artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things, we're going to have to have validated data to set up these systems, and that's data from blockchain. As transformational, though, as this technology is, be very careful. Lots of venture capitalist money is pouring in, which means fraudsters are attracted to it. So when you hear about someone having some sort of blockchain project, be critical. Ask what blockchain? Is it Bitcoin's blockchain? What's its validation scheme? How distributed is that network? How are people incentivized? Are there permissions for who can validate that network? Know what you're getting into before you invest your time, money, or your data into these projects. You know, back when I was in college, my senior year, I was relaxing because I had that firm, firm offer in hand. But this guy I knew, he was working really hard on this company that was bringing cloud computing to the hospitality industry. That company was called Airbnb. <laughs> cloud computing was big. Blockchain technologies is even bigger. It's the next step in the evolution of the internet. And it'll change everything. So look into it. Think about how you can harness it in your careers. If I could go back to that time, when I was at a rooftop in Manhattan enjoying the view, I would say to myself, enjoy that view. You worked hard for it. But don't ignore that nagging feeling that maybe things don't have to be done the way they've always been done. Because by the time everyone else starts to figure that out, you could be well on your way to creating the new reality. Thank you. <laughs>